be seated. If you would turn to number 806 in your hymnal to Psalm 62. Let us be together in this psalm. <clears throat> my soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault a man? They fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock and refuge. Trust in him at all times, O children. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Low-born men are but a breath, the highest are but a lie. If weighed on the balance, they are nothing. Together they are only a breath. Do not trust in ex extortion or take pride in stolen goods. One thing God has spoken, two things have I heard, that you, O oh God, are strong, and that you, O oh Lord, are loving. And now let us be in silent prayer. O Lord our God, in you we are given the peace that passeth all understanding. You speak to us the right words that lead us into life, into wholeness, into wellness of spirit. In you, O Lord, we receive the peace that passeth all understanding. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Surely the presence. 
presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And now I'd like to invite the children to come down for a time of sharing. <laughs> Hello there. You beat me. You beat me. You, you beat me. Yes. All by yourself. Yes. Yeah. Ah, good morning. How good to see all of you this morning. It's great to have you here. And I was even beat down here this morning, wasn't I? Right. We are, in some ways, a little community. Do any of you know what the word community means? Any ways to think about that word community? How about let's change it to uh, a group. You're like a group a group, or you're like a, hmm, kind of like a little family. A family is a community, a family is a group, and right now you're like a, a church family. Or you're like uh, the children of, of children's time. I say we'd like to invite the children to come down for a time of sharing, and, and here you are, the children of children's time. So you are a little community. We are a little community. Some of you brought your parents along. That was nice. And we are a little gathering. And, and we are sharing together as a gathering. And that's just a very nice thing. So I have an official participant tag for you today, which you can maybe use as a bookmark in a book. So I'm going to read it for you and then pass it out. It says, Share God's word. You are an official participant in children's time in Norris Religious Fellowship, January 22nd, 2012. This is a bookmark on the world. So I want each of you to have one of these official participant bookmarks. And you can take it home. And if you've got a, a book at home that, that you would like to keep it in, then you can do that. You can hold on to that when you get it. I, I'll pass them this way. Okay, you got, you hold on, why don't you hold on to that one? And I'll just keep it coming this way. Official participant bookmark on the world. Participating in children's time. Whoop, there's a blank one. Don't want that one. There you go. There you go. There. So take a look at it, and I'll read it to you once more. You see the little picture on the top, those are children sharing God's word, which you're here doing today. And then it says in red, you are Anne, and you can even put your name in there, you could write your name, official participant in children's time in Norris Religious Fellowship, January 22nd, 2012, bookmark on the world. So here we are, all of us, we're together, we're a little community, a little group, and being together makes a difference about what you do with your morning and even with your life. So thank you for being here today, and let's have a prayer, shall we? Dear God, thank you for this group where we can be together and hear your word. Amen. Thank you very much. You can have that. Yeah. Are we on? Find the room 
simply be be at peace simply be I'm guessing that most of you know the story of Jonah. We know it typically as Jonah who was swallowed by the whale. And that's how it's usually taught and understood because it's a great, a great legend and it is a, it is a legend, it's a folk tale. Uh, even in Jewish Hebrew understanding, it's a folk tale. But with it, it carries a profound truth as so many folk tales do. So remember that Jonah was a, a Hebrew, and the Lord, meaning Yahweh, spoke to him and said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great city, part of the Babylonian Empire, and I want you to warn them that they need to repent of their ways. But Jonah was afraid of that uh, directive from the Lord, and he, he ran away. And eventually he was caught, and he had to face the Lord's voice once again. And so this is what happened. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. <clears throat> so Jonah set out and he, he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city about three days across of walking. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more, 40 days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 40 days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they proclaimed a fast, and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose up from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and with ashes, and then he made a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree and of the king and of his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways. God changed his mind about the calamity he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the people listening, 
and of God responding. This next hymn, Lord, You Have Come to the Lake Shore, is based upon the scripture that we'll be reading where Jesus goes down to the lake shore and calls disciples. It's a different calling story than <clears throat> the one in John that we talked about last week. This is the calling of fishermen down at the lake shore. I think uh, many of us have sung this hymn before. The words are in the, um, in the bulletin. Uh, the refrain is repeated each time. I think you will uh, love this hymn if it's new to you. <coughs> be seated. We've had several people that we've been thinking about this week who have undergone surgery, who are laid up, who are not feeling well. 
that we've been praying for. Uh, some of those names are printed in our bulletin, and I know that so many of you have been intentional in your prayers and in your thoughts, and I can tell you uh, with, without any uncertainty at all how much that is appreciated. The voice of the community, the prayers of the community, the prayers of you, your helping hands, your, your concern, your cards, your thoughts mean so much to people that are in need. So thank you very much for what you do and who you are. Let us be in prayer with one another. Lord, there is a stillness that we can find in you. In the frenzied, harried activities of life, in the stressors that we face, in the anxieties that we have, in the problems, in the situations, in the concerns that sometimes overcome us and threaten to swamp our ship. In so many ways in life, we find peace and quiet in you. You are our quiet center. In you, we find rest. In you, we are known and understood. In you, we find the serenity, that peace that passeth all understanding, the ability to keep on going, and not just to survive, but to thrive as a disciple and as a person of faith. And so, God, for your words to us when we have needs, your words to those in our community who have been sick, who have had surgery, who need support and guidance and strength. It means so much. It is as if the people of faith are like singing angels and we look up from our place of need and we see and we hear those angels swarming around us, singing and offering that which we most need. It is a gracious act, an act that is only found within an area of faith, within a life that has been open to that mystery. And so, God, we are so grateful, and we give you thanks and praise for these gifts and all that you have given us. We remember in the stories of Jesus the Christ how he reached out hands of compassion and mercy, how he spoke words of new faith and new understanding, the right words that said, come, get with us, find something new that will change your life, make you whole and well. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. The Gospel of Mark is short and to the point. It tells this story 
of how Jesus as a, as a rabbi, as a teacher, uh, gathered his first apostles and disciples. This, by the way, was very unusual in that Eastern world at this time. It didn't really work that way. What it usually happened is that the, the teacher, the rabbi, would start talking and start proclaiming and start preaching and teaching. And then those that were listening would choose to be his disciples or not. And they would come and, and say, can I be your disciple and follow you? That was the way it worked. In this story, in Mark, Jesus chooses from among the masses. Now after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came up to Galilee from Judea, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, believe in the good news. And as Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Let us pray. Lord, may it be your spirit which will inform us, teach us, and guide us as we reflect upon words this morning. And I pray that the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth will be found acceptable in your sight. Amen. Every now and then, I have what I think is an insight. And sometimes that happens in the middle of the night. And boy, in the middle of the night, it's a great insight. By morning, it doesn't look so insightful. But I have an insight about these stories that still seems to hold true, even though it's been a couple of hours. And it seems like such a normal little insight. It's like so obvious, but yet the more I reflect on it, the more profound it becomes. So I'd like to share it with you and then talk about it a little bit. It goes something like this, this insight. The words you follow will determine what kind of community you will be a part of. The words you follow, they become the right words. The right words you follow will determine what kind of community you will be a part of. And then that community will determine who you are. And that community, based upon those words, might even change you or transform you. It seems so obvious that the words you follow determine who you will be as part of a community. So let's look at you for a minute this morning. You're all here for whatever reason you might have chosen to be here. But as I said to the children this morning, the fact that you are here makes you part of this community. You're following certain words that are an inherent part of this community. If you were part of a different community somewhere else this morning, you would be hearing different words, perhaps a different message. And that community would shape perhaps the way you relate to the world, think about the world, interact with the world. 
but you are here by choice to be part of the community of these words. Words have made such a huge difference in our life. And I, I, I'm starting to reflect on, on six areas where words have made such a huge difference. Six areas. Let me tell you what those six areas are. Spiritual, personal, educational, professional, recreational, and right now. Now, some of you are saying, what's he talking about? So let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. When I was in high school, junior, uh, let's see, sophomore and junior year, I took double courses in art, double art classes. It was great. I loved art. I got better and better. I was better then than I am now as an artist and really enjoyed it. And I thought, you know, this might take me somewhere. This, this art might, might really take me somewhere. And then I made the big mistake of talking to my guidance counselor who shared words with me. And I'm not sure if they were the right words ultimately because here I am, I guess where I'm supposed to be, or whether they were the wrong words, but they felt like the wrong words for years because the guidance counselor said, you know, if you really want to go to college and get into a good college, you, gotta, you have to take another science. You need to take chemistry. It's like, oh, I don't want to take chemistry. You know, I whined about it a bit. But I ended up taking chemistry, which meant that I had to drop art. It was horrible advice, as I reflect back on it. But I ended up going to the school where I met Sally. And I eventually ended up with an art degree, and then another degree, and then eventually here. So maybe, even though they felt like the horribly wrong words at the time, they actually took me into communities that made a difference in my life. Those words were, you need to take chemistry, changed the immediate direction of my life. That's the educational piece. The disciples, those men who were out fishing, according to Mark, there's no preamble in this story, according to the Gospel of Mark, Jesus comes along and says, follow me. Fritz says, a few words. In talking to my son Fritz, he said it was just about a few words. And I thought, but they must have been the right words, follow me. And by following those words, they gave up one community in the fishing boat and that community for another community. It changed their lives. The words we follow change our lives. And there's never, not always a guarantee, by the way, Jesus didn't say, follow me, I've got great benefits. You'll be able to retire in the lap of luxury. I've got a great program. You are going to be respected by everybody. You're going to be treated well. They're going to put you up in the finest hotels when you enter towns. By golly, you follow me, it's going to be a cushy life. There were no promises, no guarantees what those words meant. We don't always know what the words mean, but the words change our lives. Personal words. Now we're going to get interactive. Are you ready? Think about personal words that might have changed your life. Maybe just a couple little words. You got some? Does someone ever say to you, I love you? Or you say, I love you? That might have changed your life if that has happened to you. Just a few words, but they might have been the right words. The right words. Spiritual words. In the disciples' case, it was follow me. Or maybe you somehow felt God talking to you in, in a hymn or some scripture or a minister or somebody else said to you something like, hey, come check out this church. And that changed your life. Or you were at a church and you didn't like what you were hearing, and so you left, and that changed 
your life because it changed your community. The words lead us to a different community over and over again in life. How about you think for a minute of words of scripture which are short and profound but stick in your mind or stories, biblical stories that stick in your mind. You want to want to be interactive? Anyone have any ones? How about Yes, yeah. Whatsoever thy hand findest to do, do it with all your might. A verse sticks in your mind. Those are perhaps powerful words that shape the direction of movement of your life and shape your community. The Lord is my shepherd. Vice Jane. I'll fly away. I'll fly away is a powerful song for you and probably for most people here who have heard some people sing that. There's so many stories. Remember the story of the Syrophoenician woman in, in, in the gospel where she comes to Jesus and, and begs him to heal her daughter. And she said, no, I've, I've come only for the people of Israel. And she says, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the crumbs that the children drop. And he says, for those words, your daughter will be healed. The story of the blind man who calls out, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me. Those words stop Jesus in his tracks. And he says, come, what is it you want of me? Just few simple phrases change lives. Jesus stopped. And that then becomes a message to all of us that you call out in prayer and Jesus will stop and listen. And you have a right to call out in prayer. Those few words made the difference for the blind man who then could see. How about politics? They, they are short, pithy words that change the nature of things. All through the political sphere, every politician looks for that little phrase that's going to make a difference and drag people along. Doesn't matter what your political persuasion is, if the phrase is right, it might work. Recreational. Have any of you ever done anything for fun? <laughs> or been part of a, a club, maybe? Or maybe a bicycle? Or you, you um, go skiing? Has anyone ever said to you, hey, why don't you try ice skating? Come, come ice skating with me sometime. And so you do, and then you be, love it, you become part of an ice skating community. Or someone says, hey, let's go bicycling. And, and so you do, and you become part of a bicycling community that is transformative and can change your life. Or someone says, hey, why don't you try swimming? Come join the swim team. You've got a pretty good stroke, and so you do, and you can swim. Or someone says, well, you look like you like to play the guitar. Why don't you come join with us? We're jam every Wednesday night. And so you do, and so you now have a community. Words, especially of invitation, that you respond to can change your life. Personally, educa educationally, Spiritually, professionally. Anyone ever said to you, well, what are you going to do with your life? You say, oh, I don't know. I kind of like doing this or that. Well, you look like you're like math pretty well. Why don't you become an engineer? Or why don't you come over here and apply for this job? It's pretty good people. It's a pretty good job. I know that's happened to some of you here. Professionally, we are changed by the words that people suggest to us. And then there's now. There's now. That was the last one I lifted up. The words that can still change our lives right now. And we have to be so aware of the words that come to us. In, in fact, nowadays, it, it can be overwhelming. At least 10 of you have received a text in the last 20 minutes. 
and you're wondering about what's happening in Twitter, I, I don't know what Twitter is, but someone must be wondering about that. And when you get home, you might check your email, or you're going to listen to the news on NPR, turn on the TV and get some information. In listening to a news program, you're listening to what they say, they're showing special alerts, special announcements, special this, across the bottom is going another feast of information, and then there's another line underneath that perhaps, we are besieged by words and information, what do we listen to, how do we make choices? Can they ever be as simple and as right as Jesus saying, follow me? And I guess that's where we have to really start analyzing what we listen to, because it makes a difference who we are, because it makes a difference of what community we become a part of. Words, simple words, the right words, can make all the difference in the world in our lives. And that is why, so often, when I write morning prayers, or when I offer prayers, I talk about silence, and about being still, and about serenity and quiet. Because so often that's what we need more than just words. We need that quiet center where we breathe a sigh of emptiness so that then we are receptive to the right words. And we will know what they are. And then we will respond to that voice and become part of that community. And so I think and believe that in the quietness of God, that quiet center, we find the right words that change and transform our lives. Amen.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.